Well, hello there, and welcome to a special edition of the Smart Money, Dumb Money video series. Today is actually going to be a little bit longer than my normal videos that I put out every week that are maybe 10 minutes long. This video is a presentation that I recently did for the uh, Individual Investor Division of the Canadian Society of Technical Analysts, CSTA. And I've actually added one slide that I didn't show to them. Uh, I probably should have uh, built that into the presentation when I did it for them, but it just occurred to me today. So I'm building it in. Uh, the presentation was originally created in the year 2010. And the reason I created that presentation was because in 2010, uh, we had just, for those of you who were invested in the market in the uh, late uh, 2007, 8, 9 period, uh, we'll remember we had just finished going through a pretty significant bear market. And I've written a few books. Some of you may have written my books. The original one was Smart Balance, and I wrote a book called Sideways. And recently, I book, uh, wrote a book called Smart Money, Dumb Money. And in those books, I talk about how the technology bubble of 2001 one and two taught me some valuable lessons because in 2001 and two i was a no i'm not going to say a new investment advisor at the time i was a retail investment advisor because i started in the industry in 1990 but of course the 1990s were nothing but up for the markets with the odd correction so along came the bear market in 2001 and there was the terrorist act, um, you know, the twin towers and all that combined with a technology bubble that absolutely shocked me. And I, had, I really wasn't prepared for a bear market. I had just begun studying technical analysis. I had been studying it for a few years prior, but I really was, I must admit, very shell shocked at what had happened. And some of it was fairly untradeable when the Twin Towers were hit by the terrorists, uh, the markets reacted instantly. There was no way you could have possibly prepared for that kind of a washout. But nevertheless, I didn't really have a proper plan in place to deal with what was happening at that time. So I vowed to never allow that happen again. Uh, and I created a, a program, if you will, to get me out. Now, you know, another eight years or so went by and I, I was very much involved in the art of technical analysis. I uh, got my CMT designation and uh, became more and more adept at those skills. And that certainly helped me prepare for what became the 2008-2009 crash. I had developed some rules and I had also developed an understanding of things like sentiment reading. And I understood certain things such as how to read candlesticks, that kind of thing. So I put together a strategy. And then when it actually happened, because you know you don't know when a bear market is going to hit, but along came 08. And I was actually prepared, as prepared as someone who is really facing at any given time during a bear market an, an unknowable situation. So that's always going to be the case. You just don't know. But you have some tools. And I followed a strategy in 08, 09. And it actually allowed value trend to come out looking pretty good. But uh, during the, the drawdown, which the market drew down both on the S&P and the TSX and other world markets, the, the S&P and TSX both drew down over 50%. They literally had peak to trough drawdowns of, of they were cut in half. Uh, pretty scary. Uh, we at Value Trend in our equity platform saw just a little over half of that. So we, we definitely drew down. But instead of 50%, we had, I think it was around high 20s, call it 30% at the most, but it was something like 27%. I don't have the figure in front of me. Um, whatever the case, we drew down quite a, a bit less than the stock market during those years. And 
the way we did it, I'm going to explain in this presentation because this presentation was put together in 2010 after we had realized that success. And in fact, we, we invested as the market began to form a bottom and come out. And we actually ended up kind of achieving a little bit of hero status at that period because most other portfolio managers were caught in that. And we were, well, definitely uh, affected negatively by that bear market, as we will by any future bear market, by the way, uh, because the only way you can not be affected by a bear market is to be clairvoyant enough to know it's absolutely going to happen and then go 100% cash. And we just won't do that. Uh, so we were affected but we were affected much less and we recovered much much more quickly uh i actually have the statistics uh from that era i, I have my performance records and we were 100 percent whole like 100 percent whole by march of 2010 we were within a few percentage points of being entirely whole by the end of 2009 this is after a 50 percent drawdown so how did we do it? Well, that's what this seminar is all about, because we're going to talk about bull, bear, bottom, and bounce. That's the cycles of the phases that I talked about in my book, Sideways. So we don't want to be presuming that a bear market or a market correction that is a substantial correction, not a little five or 10 percenter, uh, is, is pending. We, we, we are not in the business of being Swami guru fortune tellers. We are in the business of having a trading plan. So this seminar is going to help us formulate rules to trade when the market's in a bull market towards the bullish side of the spectrum. It's going to provide us with some tools that gives us heads up on when markets may be rounding over, and then when they officially have en entered into a probable, not absolute, but probable situation where there is very likely a bear market starting, then we have a systematic approach of how to identify that and a plan on how to reduce our volatility as Value Trend did in 2009. So, and 2008, I should mention. So, that's the essence of this program is having a plan. And then as the market forms a bottom, we need a plan to identify that the bear market or correction, as it were, may be ending. And then how do we take advantage of that with the strategies that we just invoked during the bear market phase? So this seminar is about formulating a plan. It is not a predictive seminar on saying the market is going to end during a bear market as of September of 2022, and it will last for this long, and it will be this deep. That is not what I am about to do today. I am going to present an argument that the market is setting up for some probable volatility that we haven't seen for a few years, not necessarily a bear market, and I can't put a date on it, but I'm going to give you a plan on how to deal with it. So let's get started. This is a PowerPoint presentation. So you're going to really be looking at some charts over the next, say, 20 to 30 minutes. And you won't see much of me except for the little picture in the corner. So uh, it's really charts or where it's at in, in my world. So let's get started. And we're going to go right to the PowerPoint presentation, which is bull, bear, bottom, and bounce. How to profit in a volatile market. So this is our disclaimer, as we always have, and basically the opinions that I'm going to express are those of my own, and they're not investment advice. I'm not making any claims that I can advise you as to, like I said, when and if a bear market is going to occur and exactly what to do. This is just a plan that I personally did and do follow during market corrections. So... The premise that we're going to start off with is that the market is going to enter into a volatile cycle probably sometime in the next year or so. And notice I didn't put a date on that. But I'm going to give you some evidence as to why I think that might be a reasonably valid statement, but maybe I'm wrong. That's always the end of the, the day with, with analysis is that you don't know what's going to happen. You can't predict, but you can prepare. 
And that's a quote from Howard Marks, the great investor. So let's, let's say we want to work on the prepared side of the equation because the prediction side is pretty tough to do. We want to be able to beat the bear when the market is is trending down. We want to identify the probable bottom, and then we want to seize the opportunities that that bottom might create. So let's let's take a look at that. The first thing is is that we want to determine when the market is breaking down. It's it's one thing to have an opinion. Oh, I think the market's overvalued, and therefore it's going to fall. And I see this a lot. It doesn't matter what you think. We it really it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what the newspaper guy thinks. What matters is that when it's actually breaking down, okay? Because all the rest is just theory. So when it's breaking down, we, we need to know some signs of that actually happening. So some quantitative measurements we can make. We want to be able to limit our risk if the market does in fact continue on into a bear market. And then as I said, during the bottoming phase, you wanna take some opportunities uh, to buy cheap stocks. And then hopefully it enters into another multi-year bull market and off to the races. So to start with, I want to talk about there are some growing evidence of change. And if anybody knows anything about me, you'll know that I'm a real believer in sentiment indicators and I'm a contrarian investor. So when everybody likes something or everybody's excited about the market or a sector or a stock, I get worried. And, uh, you know, when I grew up, I uh, was born in the early 60s, I grew up reading Mad Magazine. And of course, Alfred E. Newman, his famous um, expression was, what, me worry? Uh, and I'm believing that right now we're seeing some signs that the market is kind of in that, what, me worry phase of existence. It, it's uh, maybe the market is ignoring some possible signs of risk. So a, a really, uh, admirable technical analyst, Jay Capel. He's a guy that has, uh, he's an amazing quantitative analyst from a technical perspective. He's, a, he's a, a known trading guru. And beyond being just this brilliant mind, he also is a philosopher and, I, and he has these rules and they're called like Jay's rules or something to that effect. And you can Google it. It's really hard to get the whole list of rules because I think it's about 30 or 40 or 50 different rules. But one of the rules, I, I read some research of his and one of the rules he, he, he just quoted recently, and I just love this. He says, if you're walking down the street and you trip and fall, that's one thing. Let's say if you're five foot 10, like I am, you trip and fall, well, you effectively, the highest point of you is going to fall five feet, 10 inches. Bump your head, probably hurt yourself, get some bruises, bumps, maybe even a a concussion. But if you're standing on a mountaintop and you trip and fall, that's an entirely different thing. Carrying that analogy further, Jay says that if you stand on a mountaintop, but you don't even know you're standing on a mountaintop and you're reaching for the sky on standing on the tips of your toes, so you're as tall and high as you could possibly be, and you're completely unaware, you're unaware that you're even on this mountaintop, and then you fall, well, that's a whole new ball of wax. And I'm not suggesting that we are on that mountaintop and unaware right now, but I think that there is some lack of awareness of where we are in the investment cycle. And there seems to be a fair amount of irrational exuberance. And we just got to watch that we don't trip and fall because we may, may not just be tripping and falling on a sidewalk. We may be tripping and falling on, in fact, some sort of a hill or mountain. That is to be seen, but I love that quote. Anyways, so let's start looking at some contrarian signs that the market may in fact be a little bit complacent. Now this chart's a, a couple of weeks old, so I, I uh, didn't update it, but I wanna give you sort of an overall view of what's known as the VIX. VIX is the uh, volatility index. It's really just a measurement of option premiums. Um, what you can see is that when markets get scared, as they did in the, the COVID crash at the beginning of 2020, the premiums on options go very, very high. When markets get complacent, as they did during Trump's first year in the election cycle, uh, when there was literally no volatility on the stock market, uh, the VIX gets very low because option traders say, well, it's this 
same thing every day. The market goes up a little bit, very, very rarely goes down, and therefore we don't need a lot of premiums for our options when you when we write an option. So that's how the VIX works. Now you can look at the VIX in two different ways. You can look at it from an absolute level point of view. In other words, where is the VIX right now? What's the number? And you can also look at it from a trend perspective because it can be a, a um, non-confirming trend, diverging trend as it's called in technical analysis against the stock market. And that can give us some heads up although it's a very, very long-term signal in that way. The absolute levels give us pretty immediate signals, particularly at market bottoms when fear is very high. So I've drawn the levels, but the, you know, the two biggies are around 32 on the VIX for a buy signal when people are capitulating, investors are capitulating, and around 12 and a half or so on the bottom when investors are too complacent. Now you can see markets can remain complacent for a while. You'll notice though that they don't capitulate for very long. They tend to, you know, the VIX spikes and then it's it's one and done. So very, very good buy signals coming out of the VIX, very uh, long-term uh, signals on, on the low end of the scale of when complacency is in place. So I like looking at the VIX from an absolute point of view, but I also like looking at a trend. So if we kind of look at this trend over 2016 and 17, you can see that you know, there, was a, there was a market correction in the summer of 2015. Some of you might remember it. It was about a 22% correction and the VIX spiked. Everybody got fearful to about, you know, about 40. Well, you can see that peak you know, laid into a series of lower peaks, lower highs. That's a trend, like all the way from basically 2015 to to the end of 2017. And you can see the market was going up. So market was getting more and more complacent. It didn't reach its absolute level of complacency below 12 until well into 2017, but it had a trend towards complacency for a good couple of three years. And that led us into uh, the corrections that were 2018. You can see the beginning of 2018, we had a correction, okay? And then, you know, you got your spike in, in the VIX and then sure enough, the trend over another basically year uh, moved into that complacency area, but the trend was diverging against the market. And at the end of 2018, December, October through December, the market corrected pretty hard actually. And it corrected much harder than at begin beginning of 2018 and the VIX spiked again. Well, what happened? The VIX started trending down again. People got more and more complacent and the market went up more and more until COVID came along. Now, COVID was an extraordinary event, but having said that, the market was already primed for something to send it off the cliff, okay? The VIX was giving us that signal. It probably if COVID hadn't broken out in you know early 2020 in North America and the panic had not ensued, then that correction might've taken three months, six months longer to occur, a year longer, I don't know. But it, it happened uh, quickly because of COVID. It just needed, I always say that the market, when it gets complacent, when the VIX is low and whatnot, it's like a balloon that's been overinflated. The balloon by itself doesn't pop, but then you can see I'm wearing cufflinks. And if my cufflink hits the balloon just as I'm walking by, then it pops the balloon and everybody blames it on the cufflink, me walking by with my cufflink. But it wasn't me walking by with the cufflink. It was an overinflated balloon. And in this case, it was an overinflated market. The VIX was telling us that. Okay. So once again, high spike, you know, very high spike. In fact, that was a, the quickest correction I've ever seen. Um, the VIX hit 82, which is just unreal. And high capitulation buy signal. Um, and then it began, began trending down again. Okay, so you can see we're in that trend right now. Now, has it hit 12? No, but it certainly, uh, by the way, it did hit 12 just before the VIX corrected. So, or the, uh, the uh, S&P corrected with COVID. So uh, we're in the trend. We're not in the absolute level, but we're most definitely trending towards a, a, an attitude of complacency that you can see on this chart, okay? And that is diverging against the movement of the S&P 500. All right. So yes, we've had a correction of late, but is it enough? And that's maybe a question I have in this seminar. So let's take a look at a close-up of the S&P since that period when uh, 
2017, as I said, Trump's first year, everybody was excited. He was doing all kinds of good things for business and the economy. And the market didn't really want to sell off. It was, you know, stimulated. The, the Fed was keeping the, their, uh, their monetary policies very accommodative. In other words, low interest rates. And the business environment was very, very positive for uh, from a government perspective. So very little volatility in the market. And you remember that the VIX was trending lower. And then we went into, after that period, a very low volatility, where that year there was not one correction that was much more than 3%. Okay, in fact, I think there wasn't anything over 3%, if I am correct. It went a little parabolic at the end, as you can see here. And then there's that first correction in 2018 and the bigger correction at the end of 2018, which was not quite 20%. I think it was about 17 or 18%. That period of volatility really didn't end until well into 2019. OK, um, and then we go into another parabolic move, which, as you'll remember, the VIX got below 12 and was trending lower during this entire time. Along came COVID. So another bull market, more traditional volatility, as you can see, after the COVID crash, uh, you know, it was an uptrend with some pullbacks. But we then entered into another one of these periods very, very similar to 2017. Since uh, the beginning of 2017, particularly since May, of, oh, sorry, um, since the beginning of 2021, and particularly since the beginning of uh, May of 2021, the volatility had been very, very contained. In fact, again, it was one of those situations like 2017, where we only saw 3% volatility uh, on any given corrective period. Well, that had to end, and it did uh, recently in, in the correction over September. Now, I'm, I'm not uh, showing you the chart that brings us through the most recent period in October, where the markets rebounded a bit, so we retraced about half of that correction. Uh, but you get the picture that volatility, even with this 5% correction, is, is not too extreme. So... The other factor that I was concerned about beyond the VIX and beyond the lack of volatility on the markets is that the PE multiple, now this is you know, part of fundamental analysis and in us technical people like to say that the fundamental analysis is the F word and we don't like to use the F word in public too often. But the markets from a fundamental perspective, at least from the price to earnings ratio, got kind of expensive recently. Now it's come down with the market correcting recently, but at one point it was like 37 times earnings. And you can see historically there, there's not been many times where you get that kind of spike without some sort of a pullback on the multiple, which usually means a pullback in price, all right? And the higher it gets, uh, like it did in 2009, as you can see here, then the worse it's going to be. As David Wilcox once said, uh, the longer it takes, the worse it's going to take taste. Uh, so I view the markets very much like that. So that's a, that's a factor. Uh, markets are still aren't cheap, even though they've come down a bit in, in price to earnings ratio. Um, Stock Traders Almanac points out that bear market bottoms often occur in the second year of the presidential cycle. And even if there's not a bear market uh, during the second year of the, mark, uh, the presidential cycle, more often than not, in the second year, you get some volatility. You saw that in the Trump presidency after his first year, 2017 and 2018, you saw two pretty sizable corrections. And you can see you know, that kind of started in, son of a gun, the fourth quarter of the year. Huh, that's kind of where we are now. And led into, well into the, the end of the third quarter of the following year. So approximately one year starting in and around uh, the fall of, uh, of uh, the first year and leading into the fall of the second year of the presidential cycle, you can get some volatility. So that certainly happened in the Trump cycle. And it's it's actually a fairly consistent trend that's happened. It doesn't happen every year, like all cycles. Um, by the way, the you know, year three and year four can be very good for uh, markets. So um, that's a factor that we should keep in mind. The party is starting to end uh, after the first year of excitement of the new president. And, uh, you know, 
things they they have to start doing the ugly stuff like maybe for example reducing some of the stimulation that we've been getting after the covid crash well the fed in fact has been stimulating the market since 2009 through various programs the subprime mortgage crisis i i.e the 0809 crash resulted in a number of uh, monetary policies, such as quantitative easing and lower interest rates and uh, twisting, in other words, manipulating the bonds. They buy the bonds and they sell one end of the bond curve and buy another. And this all created liquidity in the market and it did help the market revive from the 2009 crash. As you can see on this chart, I've marked in green whenever one of these programs started, and in fact, it did begin in 2008. I should correct myself. Um, and whenever they ended, I've marked it in red. And you can see that it's like magic. Whenever these programs ended, the market pulled back reasonably strongly at times. And so at the very best, the market would move sideways or correct, as you can see, in multiple times here. It happened many, many times, whether they raised rates or they ended a QE program or a twist program, whatever. So the other thing that the Fed is not involved with is fiscal stimulation. The fiscal policy basically means helicoptering money, uh, you know, handing out COVID checks and uh, spending money on infrastructure, that kind of thing. So that kind of thing was brought in pretty, pretty massively uh, since the COVID crash. And so now you've got monetary policy by the Fed and, and fiscal policy by the governments in power. And if and when these programs end, and I suspect tying into that second year of the presidential cycle, I suspect that maybe some of these programs will be reeled in. Well, you can see historically what happened every single time, like literally, we don't have a large data sample because it's only been since 08, but every single time that these programs ended, the market doesn't like it much. So we need to keep that in mind because this is probably the trigger that we should be watching. We're set up with the presidential cycle. We're set up with a low volatility market that needs to have volatility come back. Volatility come back. We're set up with a falling VIX that indicates more and more complacency as time goes on. But really what the trigger is going to be probably is the Fed. So keep your eye on the Fed. All right. We're not there yet. The Fed hasn't, they've said, well, maybe they'll very gently pull back in November. That may not really be the trigger. Um, but um, <clears throat> for now, the market's in a bull trend. It's above the 200 day moving average. It's higher highs, higher lows, despite the recent correction. And on this chart, I have included the recent correction. Um, all we can do is stay long until it ends. So that's how we play a bull market. I do want to point out, though, that sometimes leading into a correction, you get divergence by MACD, such as here you had a higher high, higher low on the S&P 500, but uh, falling highs and lows in the MACD, and that led into you know, some negative periods, and it seems to be happening. And again, that's not a 100% accurate predictor of anything. It's just an interesting observation. All this aside, with the potential for volatility increasing, with the presidential citation, the presidential um, uh, rhythms that we see in year two, and with the VIX and with the you know Fed maybe stepping in to reduce their their stimulations, and the government maybe reducing some of their stimulations, maybe uh, we have to keep in mind that bull markets do tend to last pretty long time periods. The, this chart is of the Dow and it goes right back to 1900. And you can see various bull markets uh, before crashes or corrective periods uh, or sideways periods, consolidations like we had in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but each one of these were, were you know, 15 to 30 years. I'm, I'm gonna suggest that probably a 15 to 20 year period might be realistic for a bull market. We're about 10 years into this one. So I don't know if we're going to get a bear market uh, right off the bat or, or anything, 
because the history is for a longer period before bear markets tend to show their ugly heads. However, we do get lots and lots and lots of opportunities such as in here for corrective periods, okay? Um, so we've, we've talked about staying in during a bull market and we've talked about identifying the possibilities of a, a period of volatility approaching us. But what happens if it does start to move into a bear market or a very highly significant correction? So we need, we need a plan. So let's talk about that plan. The plan is we want to leg out of the market if the technicals break. Now we will define what that means in a second. But to make an all or none call on the market saying, okay, that's it, I'm out. I, I would hesitate to do that because you can get whipsawed on technical signals. And if you don't know what that means, then you'll want to attend my course that will be coming out next year on technical analysis. So we want to have a, a, a program, a, a strategy where we do things in stages. And that's what I mean by leg out. We want to increase cash as markets show signs, they are continuing to break levels of support. We want to rotate into lower volatility sectors, such as utilities, bonds, that kind of thing. We want to create, and by bonds, I mean short-term bonds. And we want to possibly even hedge, all right? And there's lots of different hedge instruments, such as you can buy VIX ETFs, which tend to spike, as we saw. You can buy inverse ETFs, single inverse. You can buy... Uh, uh, actual shorting ETFs like HDGE. I'm not making recommendations here. I'm just saying these are hedges and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So here's what we're looking at. If the market breaks its uptrend, that can be identified by the lack of higher highs and higher lows. You know the uh, definition of an uptrend is higher highs, higher lows, Generally, the market stays above the 200-day moving average, which is this blue line here. Now, people get all tied up with the moving average, the 200-day or the 40-week. It doesn't, if the market crosses the 200-day, as it does a lot, it doesn't mean that the bear market is suddenly upon us, but it's, it's a confirmation. So the most important thing we look for is where are the lows? And if they are starting to break down into lower lows, that's our very first sign. So th what happened, then this is, this is a look at the uh, uh, 2003 to seven bull market followed by the 2008 to nine bear market. What happened in early 08 is that we got a lower low. All right. We confirm if that's the real McCoy by watching it rise. And in this case, it rose as, you know, whenever you get a washout, you typically get a rebound. But that high obviously started to round over before reaching its old highs, let alone even crossing its old lows. At the same time, it was struggling at the 200-day moving average. So in 2008, we sold a little bit of equity as we saw this happen. Did we sell at the top? Heck no. What we did was we sold on our first observation of the potential of a new downtrend. Did we know, did we have a crystal ball that the market was going to do what it did? No. So did we go 100% cash? No. In fact, we went about 10% cash or so at that point, 10, 12% cash. So we, you know, we legged out. Well, what happens is market went down. We go, man, wish, wish we could have risen, raised more cash. We should have been smarter. Well, this time the market does another pullback because every time it, you'll notice whenever markets pull back in an extreme level, RSI and all the momentum indicators get oversold and they tend to rebound a little bit. The markets will rebound. Sure enough, they rebounded after another leg down, which happened to have a lower low than the last one. The next high was much lower than both the previous high and the previous low. It was still well below the moving average. Guess what we did? We sold. Now this time we sold a whole bunch <laughs> and we came to around 30% cash. Now, Hindsight is great, isn't it? Because knowing what I know now, I should have gone 100% cash, but you can't do that. You don't know, right? So 
we went to about 30% cash. We didn't have a chance of legging out anymore because the market just went to uh, hell in a handbasket and fell out of bed very quickly after that. So we were stuck with a 30% cash, but that's better than nothing. And what happened was the market began to form a bottom. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But this is exactly how we conducted ourselves in the years 2008, 2009. We didn't know, as Howard Mark says, you can't predict, you can prepare. Our plan was, hey, we're going to look at the trend. And by the way, the sentiment at that time was suggesting that things were overbought in 07. So in fact, in 07, uh, there was a bit of an oil bubble going on and I sold most of my oil. Now, the second part of the oil that we sold, the last position we held, we sold it in this in uh, early 2009. But uh, sorry, I should say early 2008. But we did recognize there was a bubble of some sorts when everybody was talking about oil going to $200 at that time. It was about 140 bucks a barrel. And interesting from a human psychology point of view, by the way, we, I actually had a client phone me and say, I'm leaving you because you're, you're selling oil and you're missing the boat because oil was doing money. nothing but going up. And it turned out that I was quite right. <laughs> Although I did sell a bit early, I was selling oil at 80, 90 bucks. It went on to 140 and then it crashed to 30. And I, by the way, I rebought in the thirties. Um, so that was purely from a sentiment point of view. I was looking at some of these sentiment indicators, but there was there were some signs from a sentiment perspective that the markets were overbought. Breadth was a little thin because everybody was focused on a few groups like oil. But more important was the chart itself. So just what we talked about, the trend was breaking down. So now that we're in a bear market, we've got some cash, hopefully. We anticipate the bottom. We look at the peak and trough patterns when it stops making lower highs and lower lows. That's your obvious sign. Okay, sentiment will tend to trough. The VIX will, like we saw a bit ago, uh, the VIX will go over 30. Other factors such as seasonality and momentum maybe, maybe will come in. Momentum may be oversold. The factors that I use in my barometer are pretty good at uh, telling us when, when things have become oversold. And so at that point, we, when we start to see these signs, although we're not absolutely convinced that the bear market's over, we definitely, if we have hedges, such as uh, an inverse ETF, if you decide to do that, uh, you want to remove them, okay? You can possibly make one leg into the market if you are anticipating a bottom. And I'm going to give you some little tidbits on how we might make that assertion that maybe the market's putting in a bottom, but you don't know for sure. So you don't commit too much capital. I know everybody wants to take their full 30% or whatever 40% cash that they've saved after recognizing the bear market and then buy right at the bottom and make a fortune because that's what I heard some guy up the street did. And he meant, you know, but that doesn't happen to most of us. Most of us don't buy at the bottom. So we have a strategy. Maybe we can leg in if we see a sign that the market might be bottom, bottoming, as John Templeton said, to, to buy when others are despondently selling requires the greatest fortitude, but pays the greatest returns. So if you want uh, to know more about some of these signals, sentiment signals, that type of thing, like the VIX, I've written that book, Smart Money, Dumb Money, and that's what the book's all about. I literally present uh, 15 or 20 different types of indicators that can tell you when, when various markets are, are making a bottom, okay, or a top. So um, one of the things we can look for is a MACD crossover. You can see sometimes uh, it's a little bit lagging, but when the market makes a bottom, you'll see a, a positive crossover as you did here and here. No, they, they weren't at the very bottom. Uh, you'll see things like the VIX, uh, put the call, stuff like that, that make uh, market um, that, that tend to peak during market bottoms, like we talked about before, okay? When pessimism is extremely high, that can give us a signal. But even more importantly, we can look at, well, not more importantly, but certainly significantly, we can look at reversal signs. Now, I'm a lover of candlesticks. You can look at the bar charts and they have similar formations as this, but the candlesticks are wonderful because they're very colorful and they, they have cute names and they're very obvious when you look at a candlestick that is reversal. 
There are many, many candlesticks out there. And if you read my book sideways, I give a description of the main ones I use. But as far as reversal candles, these on this page are the kinks. And if you, if you learn nothing else about candlesticks, just know this. Big wicks with small bodies usually means a tournament, okay? The body can be in the middle or at the bottom and the top, but a, a big wick means that the market moved. So in this case, the market opened here because the body represents the open and close. Okay, the market opened here and it closed there. But in the time period of the day, it flushed out big time. And you can see the bigger the wick, the more significant that flush was. So that's considered bullish. Now, by the way, bearish, reverse inverse candles or shooting stars as they call them, but I call them inverse uh, hammers. Um, they are uh, equally good at identifying bottoms because the market is, you know, flushed and, you know, opened, opened here, closed there, had this big spike and then ended up closing down. That can be a negative. It's often at a top. It's funny enough, they happen at bottoms too. And I don't know why that is. I can't, I don't know the psychology, but the, the observation I have made with spinning tops as well, or doji candles where there's almost no body, it's just a whole bunch of action with, with not much happening by the end of the day. And so that's what you want to keep an eye on, because that usually means indecision. All of these candles on this page are where the market reacted strongly, you know, get out, get out, or get in, get in. And then at the end of the day, oh, maybe not, you know, and, and everybody kind of acted with indecision by the end of the day. And that almost always leads into a turnaround. Okay, so I'm going to show you examples. Son of a gun, the 0809 bear market. This is a daily chart. Guess what happened? Both uh, a hammer, an inverted hammer. Remember, we just said, hey, those things are supposed to be bearish. Well, in this case, it was bullish. Uh, so that's why I don't necessarily trust that the hammers are, are have to be only with the body at the top. Doji, uh, spinning top, call it what you want. Uh, big indicator of a turnaround because boy, did it ever move up a lot and down a lot in the end of the day, it settled, settled right, right close to the middle. All right, very good sign of a turnaround. You can look at these, there's a doji, there's an inverted hammer, boom, market went down. You'll see this all the time, all right? Happened here, boom, market went up. So, but I'm looking at it from a washout point of view. If you've got all these other signals, such as the VIX at a spike and, and all these other things, then you see a candle like this, you've just got some pretty good confirmation that the market is bottoming. Look at this, this is a candlestick. Uh, now, by the way, candlesticks are best to look at on a daily chart. Uh, you just don't get the same kind of signals on a weekly. So again, you'll notice that a lot of these formations where there's the big wicks, small bodies, happen at turning points all the time, okay? so. It's, it's not just at bear market bottoms and bull market tops, it's all the time. So you can use it in whatever perspective you want, but I really like to look for candles when the market's been washing out. All right, so let's say you put one leg into the market because you saw a candle, you saw the VIX, you saw you know, all the other sentiment indicators you look at and boom, I'm willing to put a third, in my example, 30% cash you held. So let's say maybe you take 10%, you put it in the market right at the bottom because you don't know that that's actually the bottom just because there's a candle and all these other things that say so. You can get wave number two of bad news come through and you just get proven wrong. So there's an old saying that bulls make money and bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. If you, if you make an all or none decision when you're selling into a bear market or buying into a bull market, you just take everything out or everything in, you are a fool who is about to get slaughtered. Okay, so bulls make money and bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. So don't catch the falling knife, have a strategy. So, okay, you've done your first initial purchase. You're hoping that you actually are right about it being the bottom, but you've only committed a third of your cash. Now you see a breakout from that base, all right? It doesn't, people like to give all these formations interesting names like head and shoulders and double bottoms. That's interesting, but the bottom line is highs and lows. A base is indicated when you're not making any lower lows and lower highs, but you're not making any higher highs and higher lows either. You're kind of going sideways of some sort. 
Well, when you break out of that base, you cross the neckline, that's a crossover, that's a base breakout. And then you get a, a, a breakout over the moving average. That's a signal that you should be getting in. So now you've already done one leg, let's say, because you hopefully predicted the bottom, but you're not 100% sure. Then you move in in a couple of more stages. All right, you're fully invested and you increase your beta. You move out of your utilities for those stocks you do hold and you move into you know, Microsoft or something, high, high, higher beta stock. Um, this is not the market, this is a stock, but this is a good example because it's been a pretty interesting trader, higher highs, higher lows, moving average, broken, boom, sell. You know, you, you sell on the, on, the, on the break, you don't, and you wait for the rebound because things get oversold doesn't get over the moving average, doesn't take out the last lows and highs, which it didn't, then you, you, you sell, okay? You start legging out, maybe you leg one here, leg two there, leg three there, or something like that. You can do it in two stages. Now that you've, oops, now that you've sold, now you're looking for the bottom. Well, uh, this is not a candlestick chart, but let's say sentiment on Bombardier, because you can, you can look, you look at different sentiment indicators on, on individual stocks as well. If you subscribe to sentimenttrader.com, and I'm not associated with them, I'm just noting that they have all the indicators. Um, then maybe you notice that things are getting washed out from Bombardier, and then you see a candlestick down here, one of those dojis or something. Then maybe you make your first move, and then you start to notice, oh, there's a high, there's a low, oh, there's a high that took out that high and that high in the in the neckline, took out that high, took out that old neckline. Maybe I ought to try to enter. Sometimes I like to wait for a retest of the neckline. There it was, and then I want to confirm it bounces through the neckline, you buy. Okay, you buy maybe up here, a little higher, and off you go. One, two, three legs. And you know, hopefully Bombardier goes to the moon. Meantime, there's your 200 day moving average. So that is kind of the strategy that we used on the market. You can see there's our sell signals, here's our buy. You got a let's call it a head and shoulders buy, because actually it kind of was shoulder, shoulder, head. Wash out. Uh, this is a weekly chart, so you're not seeing that nice little spinning top and, uh, and inverted uh, hammer. Uh, but you saw on the last slide a couple of slides ago that that is, in fact, what happened. So then you get a so you did your first increment of purchasing there. The market starts moving up. Oh, my gosh, it's moved above the 200 day moving average, which in this case is a 40 week. Same thing. There's your neckline. It's clear that's the neckline you can see there when it breaks above that neckline. You buy your second thing. You maybe wait to see if it tests the neckline. In this case, it didn't. You give it in a couple of bars. If it doesn't retest, well, you, you do your second leg into the market and so on. So that's literally what we did. All right. It's not rocket surgery. This is, this is something that, and it's not absolute as well. I want to point out that this is a strategy. And so that's why we work with legs because things can go sideways and back down very quickly so you're doing things in stages so you're during the bear market you leg out in a few stages you lower your beta and you maybe hedge depending on how confident you are i never hedge fully but you know you can maybe offset another 10 percent by buying 10 percent of a single inverse or something um when you anticipate the bottom through using sentiment and whatnot um you uh, you remove your hedges um, you watch for a breakout and you leg back in. The safer way to do it is to not predict the bottom with those candlesticks and sentiment indicators. You just wait for the, the breakout. But if you want, you can make your first leg right, right at what you anticipate the bottom is. And then as you see that neckline broken, you leg in a couple more times to get fully invested. All right. So that is the basic program. As you can see, it ain't rocket science. It's something you can do, and it's a plan. So you now have the tools. Watch this video twice if you have to. Write down the, the general rules and have a plan. So if and when the market begins to correct, you can follow the plan. And maybe you get whipsawed. Maybe the market breaks the 200-day and a low and whatever, and then it goes right back up again. That can happen. But if you don't have a plan, and you do nothing, then I guarantee you, you're going to go down like everybody else did in 2009 in the next bear market. If the market goes down 50%, you're going to go down 50%. If you have a plan, you won't go down that much. We didn't. So this is my suggestion is to create a plan, 
You can get a little bit more detailed by reading my books, Sideways and Smart Money Dumb Money will help you out in this way. And be prepared. You can't predict, but you can prepare. Thanks for watching.